morning. Welcome to this SEPS ECRI webinar on moratoria on loan repayment status quo and phase out. My name is Willem Pieter de Hoon and I will be your moderator today. During the webinar, we will discuss the credit moratorium in installed in response to COVID-19 to offer borrowers temporary relief. We'll start this webinar with a short presentation of a survey, uh, survey among credit uh, reference agencies and follow uh, today's webinar uh, with a panel discussion uh, with Roberto Filippis of the EBA, Francesco Franco Di Stefano from Intesa San Paolo, Gerhard Hummer from SME United, Deborah Farre from Buke, and we fi finalized the panel with an um, intervention of uh, Enrico Velasquez from um, Axis. Um, after we've concluded the initial round of interventions, there will be a debate with the panelists in which also you can have your questions or comments uh, answered and or responded to. For that, we ask you to use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen, which allows you uh, to pose questions to the panels, uh, panelists. As mentioned, we will start with the presentation uh, of the results of a survey that was conducted uh, among the members of AXIS. You should now see the uh, survey on your screen. Let's, sorry. Oh, good. So um, mid last year, uh, ECRI has conducted a survey among the members of AXIS. Uh, AXIS represents uh, the credit reference agencies in uh, Europe. Um, for those that are not familiar with credit reference agencies, uh, they are um, important in conducting and re re maintaining historic credit information on both individuals and businesses. Uh, which allows uh, banks and others uh, to assess their uh, credit worthiness. Um, this uh, survey, which was conducted in, in 2020, um, was the fifth uh, of its kind. Um, basically, since 2010, uh, Axis has been conducting this survey uh, every two to three years. Uh, today, we will focus uh, on the results related to COVID-19. Uh, uh, but besides that, and in particular, if you're of course interested, it might be interesting to, to have a look at the survey results as it also covers um, more information about the business indicators and characteristics, the quality of the data held uh, by the CRAs, um, as well as uh, how the, the information is being used, as well as how the competitive landscape and regulatory framework differs across countries. I think in this case, it's, it's important also to, to see that these uh, CRAs are quite different uh, across countries. Um, in the survey, um, there, is, uh, there are responses from uh, 39 uh, AXIS members. In total, AXIS has uh, 42 members, so basically all Almost all uh, members of uh, AXIS participated uh, in the, the, the survey, which gives a quite good uh, view on um, the information that credit reference agencies have um, in Europe uh, about uh, the developments. Of course, today we'll primarily focus on, on COVID-19. So in the survey, in total, uh, 28 countries were covered, of which 16 uh, belong to the EU27. Um, in most countries, there is one CRA, but uh, there are also countries where there are up to uh, four uh, CRAs. So that way, uh, in some cases, you see that uh, several uh, countries are represented. Um, the CRAs are quite diverse in terms of ownership, but also the activities and the, the, the type of data and customers they have. So. Um, if you have one country in mind, it might not be representative for the entire uh, EU or uh, even the entire uh, Europe. So if we look for instance at ownership, you have uh, publicly owned CRAs, but you also have uh, private CRAs or those that are fulfilling a nonprofit function are for instance uh, owned by uh, an association uh, of uh, lenders. So in that sense, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, diversity uh, in the ownership. Also, if you look at the type of data covered, um, most 
of the CRAs collect information on individuals or basically all of them, but uh, uh, on sole traders, SMEs, uh, large companies, municipalities, and, and other um, more publicly uh, organizations, you see that the coverage uh, is, 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 is more different uh, across uh, countries. Um, if we then go uh, look at the data collected, so traditionally, of course, most of the data collected uh, is uh, from banks, but you see that increasingly uh, CRAs are collecting data also from other uh, providers, uh, from either being financial, uh, other types of lenders, but also insurance providers, uh, other financial service providers, but also uh, utility companies, uh, other authorities, including central bank tax authorities, um, uh, courts, um, and then uh, also even um, say non-financial, non-utilities uh, and authorities, including, for instance, uh, home rental uh, companies. Uh, the coverage um, differs uh, from uh, country to country, uh, but in general, you see that uh, the CRAs are increasing uh, their um, uh, coverage, uh, mostly beyond banks, which is, is the most uh, common. Uh, this gives them, of course, a, a quite good um, information um, about uh, the developments related to uh, credit of individuals and uh, also um, businesses. Um, if we then look and, and turn to uh, COVID, uh, we see that uh, the uh, CRAs uh, have a view on the one hand on how many um, individuals and businesses uh, have made use of the payment holiday schemes, or how, how many countries also these uh, schemes exist. On the other hand, they also see uh, what's happening in uh, the non-performing loans. And then of course, finally, they also see where most uh, credit information is uh, demanded and also how that has changed, of course, uh, in the past year uh, due to COVID. If we look uh, at the countries uh, that were subject to the, to the service, so 28 uh, European countries, we see that in uh, about two thirds of these uh, countries, um, as of the second half of last year, there were uh, pavement holiday schemes um, introduced. Um, in most of these payment holiday schemes were anticipated by uh, the CRA. So they um, made some uh, special indicator or they use uh, other provisions to indicate it in their uh, databases. Uh, others didn't do anything uh, uh, special. Uh, so either that was based on uh, instruction from the uh, authorities or um, they just use their uh, existing uh, reporting on these kind of uh, schemes and facilities. If we then move to the use of the uh, credit moratorium or payment holiday schemes, uh, we of course see that already in the first quarter uh, that uh, the um, COVID was there, there was a, a significant increase in the usage. Um, it's a bit difficult to make a real uh, comparison uh, across countries because the CRAs in some countries cover only negative data and other co countries they cover both positive and negative uh, data, which uh, changes a lot uh, the uh, denominator in the equation of uh, share of uh, the uh, borrowers uh, using the credit moratorium anyway. You see that here on average, depending a bit on which field, it's between five and over 10% of individuals and uh, businesses uh, that were uh, making use of these credit moratoria uh, straight after the first round of lockdowns. I think some of the panelists will also say later on a bit on how that has evolved uh, afterwards. If we go then to the uh, non-performing loans, uh, both for individuals and uh, businesses. We actually, strikingly maybe, but I think in the meantime, there has already been quite a bit of news about it, that in most countries, actually, the non-performing loans for so far has, have not gone up. And even in some countries, we have witnessed that the uh, non-performing loans have gone down. Now, this is also something that we found uh, in the survey, um, where 
among both households and uh, individual uh, and uh, businesses, whether you look at uh, consumer loans or mortgages or, or company loans, you see everywhere that it either remained stable or even decreased a bit uh, in the first quarter that um, COVID was there. Um, if we then look, of course, at explanations for this, it's most probably primarily the, the government measures, uh, as well as that only a particular part of the um, economy was uh, heavily uh, hit uh, by uh, COVID. So um, if you look at the functioning of the CRAs themselves, uh, large majority or almost all of them uh, did not have any issues despite uh, the move to uh, more uh, digital uh, inf information uh, co co collection and exchange uh, in continuing their uh, service. Um, if you look at their uh, information request, we see of course also a change in their uh, say uh, demands or the demands for uh, information from CRAs, there was a bit of a shift on the one hand from in, uh, the um, say uh, providers of consumer loans more towards those uh, active in e-commerce and uh, B2B services. So really you saw, so a shift more from the offline economy to more the uh, online economy also in the request for uh, credit information. Um, from the CRAs. Um, going forward, the uh, CRAs in general uh, don't expect uh, too much change, though uh, those that expect change see that primarily this increase in online activity is likely uh, to remain uh, there for the time being. So I think it's, it's, it's of course, uh, a nice confirmation of what many of you uh, might already think that also the, the, the CRAs uh, expect this. Um, I would like now to um, move to the panel discussion. Um, if you have uh, any questions on this, there is a possibility during on this uh, presentation, there's a possibility during the Q&A. Uh, otherwise, also in the chat, uh, a link to the uh, study, uh, including all the results of the survey uh, will be uh, posted. But let's now go over to um, Roberta de Filippis from uh, the EBA. Uh, she will give us an update uh, on the work that the EBA has done, but also uh, what is going to be next. Yeah, thank Roberta, you. Roberta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good morning to all. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to participate to this webinar today. Uh, we are navigating difficult times and I find discussing these topics very important. So one of the main decisive actions taken by EBA at the onset of the crisis was the publication of the guidance on legislative and non-legislative moratoria. These guidelines address the prudential treatment of payment moratoria, which were introduced by several countries as a support measure to provide the necessary breathing space to borrowers facing liquidity challenges due to the pandemic. So these guidelines, what they clarify? They clarify that the payment moratoria do not trigger forbearance classification and the assessment of distress restructuring if they, if they respect some condition, but basically if they are based on the applicable national law or an industry-wide initiative agreed and applied broadly by the relevant credit institutions. So what is the aim? The aim of the guidance was therefore to safeguard borrowers with temporary liquidity problems due to COVID-19, but also to require the assessment of the long-term unlikeliness to pay. From the out outset of the crisis, the EBA had to balance from one side, the need for maintaining banks' ability to provide lending and supporting liquidity shortages of European businesses, and from the other side, the need for banks to set aside capital for increase, increasingly likely losses stemming from clients that are no longer able to meet their payment obligations. With our last reactivation of the guidelines of moratoria in December 2020, we tried to find a balance to this trade-off. Uh, and in particular, we introduced two additional safeguards. So first of all, acknowledging that longer durations of payment extension towards the same obligor may signal solvency issues, we introduced a nine, a nine months cap requirement on the length of the payment extension granted for each exposures. 
And moreover, banks now are also requested to document their supervisors, uh, their plan for assessing that the exposure subject to the general payment moratoria do not become unlikely to pay. Uh, this requirement is important, first of all, to incentivize banks' assessment of their exposure under moratoria, but also to allow supervisors to take uh, any appropriate action. Now, beyond these conditions, the treatment for C in the EBA guidelines and moratoria cannot be applied, and this means that institutions should assess when deciding to grant further moratoria whether the definition of forbearance and or default is met. And as such, banks would have to start setting aside provisions for forborn exposure and set aside capital when their clients no longer could meet their financial obligations. Now, uh, the payment moratoria have been an effective tool to sustain the flow of credit during the last year of the pandemic. Uh, in total, almost one trillion of loans have benefited from moratoria on loan repayment. Uh, despite this unprecedented support and flexibility granted, after more than a year of crisis condition, it is clear that uh, bank supervisors are increasingly worried about the consequences of the crisis on banks' lending book. Keeping credit support in the form of large-scale moratoria over a prolonged period, it can adversely impact economic recovery, in fact, if public and private resources are allocated especially to unviable businesses. And moreover, it may also uh, adversely impact that repayment incentives over a long horizon. So in this context, going substantially beyond the flexibility already provided in the current guidelines would not appear prudent as this would entail that the risk of client facing difficulties are likely to be underestimated in, in, underestimated in bank's balance sheet, which would increase the financial stability risk indeed. So we would, however, stress that banks' lending is not, is not in any way contingent on the, on the EBA guidelines or moratoria, as this remains a business decision on the side of the banks and also on the side of the governments of, of, of whether extending the national moratoria. Moreover, EBA will continue to stress the need for banks to support the economy with sound, lend, sound lending. As also stressed, for instance, in our re recently published loan origination guidelines, institutions must ensure that their practices are aligned with consumer protection rules and respect fair treatment of consumers. However, at the same time, it will be important that also banks manage their risks. And uh, it is unfortunately becoming increasingly clear that not all clients will be able to service their debt. Uh, let me also stress uh, that it is important to phase out smoothly the support measure implemented so far and monitor closer, closely the situation. As the payment moratoria start to expire, and let me say that uh, now uh, the, the, the guidelines will expire from the end of March, but this does not mean that the, the, the payment moratoria could ex will expire according to the duration of the extension. Now, banks and borrowers uh, experiencing financial difficulties should proactively work together in finding the most appropriate solution for their circumstances. That should include not only financial restructuring where banks have experience and internal capacity, but also the, to the extent possible operational restructuring aimed at restoring the viability of such borrowers. There will, however, also be need for fiscal measure in this regards. As of today, in fact, government roles in ensuring a smooth transition is crucial by targeting fiscal measure to support the most vulnerable sector and firms. And also by facilitating, let me say that, the exit of the unviable ones. In this respect, a coherent and consistent application of the European Resolution Framework is, is therefore a precondition of an orderly exit for those that become non-viable in the crisis. The EBA, anyway, is monitoring the risks in the banking sector as well as the area of the regulatory framework, which would deserve further clarification, just like whether there are any areas where the framework should be relaxed. At this juncture, the EBA deems the framework is appropriate and that no changes should be made, but this does not exclude that this situation could evolve in the future. To conclude, let me stress that in contrast to previous crises, banks this time are not part of the problem, but rather have been part of the solution to support the economy. And this was possible among other things, thanks also to their, their strong capital and liquidity position. Let me say that should the pandemic have hit the banking sector as it was in 2009, for example, we will not be here discussing how banks can contribute to the recovery, but rather how to avoid the collapse of the sector. And so this shows how important it is that banks continue to reflect risks properly 
in their balance sheet, maintaining an appropriate capital level. And in this context, we are careful in creating an expectation that we will continue introducing accommodative, accommodative interpretation of the rules as the crisis unfolds. This may in fact facilitate imprudent lending and so may undermine the results obtained with the regulatory reforms agreed at global level in the recent year. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Roberta. M many points I think that we can, of course, uh, touch upon also in the discussion later on. If you have any questions for Roberta, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen uh, and we'll come back to it uh, towards uh, after the, the panel. Uh, but first we go to uh, Franco De Stefano from Intesa San Paolo. Uh, of course, Roberta also mentioned that uh, you as a bank are, are part of the, the solution, but we need to be careful uh, that also the risk and are well reflected, for instance, in your balance sheet and, and financial uh, other financial figures. Um, uh, Franco, uh, what are you as Intesa doing to indeed support the economy and what will you be doing uh, going forward? Well, thank you. And thank you, Roberta, for your explanation. It was quite interesting. I mean, uh, when we talk about sound credit in this period, it's quite difficult, you know, because uh, banks are not ordinary companies. They live in the territory, they, they benefit from the territory. And so, I mean, we need to uh, make sound and uh, good credit, but at the same time, we need to help the environment and the ecosystem in which we operate, otherwise we cannot survive. But I, I agree completely with Roberta that our solution is the key to exit uh, this difficult uh, period. So let, let's, uh, if you if you don't mind, I, I would just uh, describe what we did and what we are going to do and what will be uh, on our side, the focus that banks should have, not only banks actually, to, to recover from this uh, um, difficult moment. And uh, I would go even beyond only moratoria because I think that intervention should be a bit wider, a bit, at a, as, a, should have a wider spectrum. And, you know, we, we are now at more than one year from the beginning of the crisis. So it's a moment, a good moment to make some uh, balance, you know, to, to see what happened and how things could have been done better and uh, what can we do later on. Uh, starting from uh, what uh, um, the pandemic has changed in our lives, because it, it changed dramatically the way we we work, the way we travel, the manner in which we communicate and learn, for example. And overall, I must say, it has also enhanced the way we take care of the needs of our people, our territories and our customers by increasing our right to do things better, notably over climate, diversity, equity and inclusion. As you know, um, well, our bank is an Italian bank and Italy was hit particularly hard by the pandemic and it has triggered an extraordinary crisis that has affected in particular families, small businesses and SMEs, which are the backbone of our economy, of Italian economy. And uh, in these last 13 months, our role as a bank in supporting the country has been crucial in extending credit to families and small businesses, thus protecting jobs and providing liquidity in productive sectors. We were the first bank in Italy to provide loan and mortgage moratoria, even when the regulatory framework in Italy was, was not yet clear. We strongly believe that the urgency to support our customer justified taking such risks. And we provided state guarantee loans for a total of 35 billion. And these, uh, believe me, required an unprecedented effort on our side as Italy's ecosystem is made of almost 4 million of micro and small enterprises. So a very huge, we did a very huge job in order to be quite immediate in uh, providing support to our economy. At the same time, we also realized that uh, uh, we were in a, an unprecedented scenario, an unprecedented situation, and we, we could not face the, the crisis with the traditional banking products. So we tried to, um, to, to make up something that was new, and we experimented our territories, the, the innovation of impact loans. Impact loans are new and highly innovative tools that offer extended repayment terms to, um, to our customer and provide resources dedicated to businesses with high social impact on the business ecosystem. They introduce the concept of pay for results with very low interest rates that could ultimately be cancelled when the ecosystem reaches some predefined threshold. Impact loans have, um, 
are therefore bound to recreate um, the ecosystem and uh, an earthly ecosystem and depart from the concept of business as a single business but uh, uh, seeing the, the community as a whole all system and so whenever the whole system the ecosystem gets better the companies in that ecosystem are getting better and the banks all obviously are getting better because they operate with some clients so it's a it's a very um virtual scenario and um, just to give you some number we have organized and delivered impact loans and grants to over 1000 micro enterprises based in bergamo and florence under a program that we call the rinascimento renaissance and we help these companies to uh, pursuing their missions in areas that were deeply ravaged by the COVID-19 pandemic. I remind you, if you don't, that Bergamo was the most hit area in Europe. Um, this experience has been a very great experience for us. We also helped the companies to elaborate business plans, elaborate solutions, was, was not only linked to make financings to these companies, but was actually linked to recreate, as I said, an ecosystem with uh, uh, all our expertise that was not only related to financing. This is really in time with the core culture and spirit of Intel Sao Paulo Group. That's, that is briefly what we did in the past. Let's see what uh, we think should happen now. I mean, now, obviously, we are in a different situation. We have vaccine plans and, uh, uh, and there is a broad political consensus to rebuild the global economy. And that's why 2021 is projected to be the year of recovery. That is not going to be an easy recovery uh, anyway, neither economically or nor socially. And that's why we think that we need to rethink how we support customers. At the beginning, um, uh, there was an almost indiscriminate solution in, to, to help customers. So we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know what we were expecting. And so we actually basically gave time to all our customers. Uh, I don't think we cannot do this anymore. I mean, we now need to focus and uh, channel our help uh, and target our help more specifically. Um, uh, you know, there is, when I talk about helping, I'm not talking about uh, only banks, but I talk about government support also. I mean, we, we need a structured solution in order to overcome the crisis. And as I said, I need, uh, we need to bet to have a better focus. There are companies that are quite strong who just do not need help. They can face the situation by themselves. And on the other side, there are companies that even with a big help will not be able to overcome the crisis. On the other side, there are companies where an help from, from banks, but governments, whatever, could make a big difference. And that's where we should concentrate, just to be more effective in helping companies where that help can be most effective. How can we do this? I mean, it's not easy, obviously, but we do have a, um, a strong... Uh, um, a strong asset on our side that is a huge liquidity that we have on the on the market you know companies even consumers have not spent much during last year and the liquidity in the system is quite high we need to channel this liquidity make sure that this liquidity is uh, for, is uh, channeled into the real economy in investments in order to foster the recovery of our economies uh, I guess that these should be absolutely the focus and our efforts should be channeled on this to, to, to push on this liquidity and to give help when the help is really more efficient to be given. I would stop here and I'm always obviously available for any kind of question you might have. Thank you very much, uh, Franco. Indeed, if you have a question for Franco, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, uh, we now move to Gerard Hummer from uh, Azumi United. Uh, Gerard, you have now, of course, also heard uh, the voice of, of the, the, the policymaker uh, and uh, a banker. Both of them say uh, uh, moratoria have in general served their purpose uh, for a temporary per period, but we're now needing some more structural uh, measures and also more tailored uh, measures. Uh, you're representing uh, SMEs in Europe. What are your views uh, on this? Good morning, everybody. Thank you, William, uh, for uh, inviting me to this discussion, which is a very timely moment because we are now really in a critical juncture uh, if we will be able to get the recovery right or not. 
Um, but let me say start from the beginning. In the first phase of the crisis last spring, we had about 80% of companies which uh, had a significant loss in turnover <clears throat> uh, and uh, which turns into, of course, liquidity problems. There was a wide range of liquidity measures. Uh, moratoria was maybe one of the most important of them. And uh, after a certain period of uh, problems uh, where banks faced uh, in managing the, the distribution of moratoria, uh, I think early summer the situation improved significantly. <clears throat> also, the situation as we, of SMEs uh, with the end of the lockdowns uh, in summer. Uh, Get, got better and we had de facto in August, September hardly complaints about um, loan shortages, etc. Uh, anymore. However, the situation really changed uh, with the second wave and the, the new lockdowns we see since November, uh, which are not over there yet. And many companies went into these lockdowns with already high level of, uh, of debt in their balance sheets, coming not only from uh, bank loans, but also from tax deferrals, uh, from additional public loans, uh, loan guarantees, uh, coming from deferrals or postponements of social security payments, coming from insurance payments, postponements, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in this situation, uh, if you have another um, the run into another recession de facto because SMEs are in the first, uh, first quarter, in the last quarter last year, in the first quarter this year in a recession, uh, makes it extremely difficult. And uh, of course, we have been very happy with uh, the prolongation or the new guidance from the, the EBA uh, on the treatment of moratoria in December, uh, because from December on, we have the first signs um, as regards uh, tightening of bank lending, uh, increasing the, the costs of loans, uh, requesting more, more uh, collaterals, et cetera, et cetera. So it's both the FASE survey, but and also the, the bank lending survey of the ECB uh, show, have shown this tightening <clears throat> towards the end of the year. And our companies are more afraid now about uh, access to, to loans than they have been, let's say, in September, October. So in this situation, uh, we have now to consider what are the next steps, because I fully agree what I said before, that not all SMEs uh, will get back to business before, and there, there will be, there will be uh, SMEs which have to leave uh, the market or has to be restructured or uh, in any way. The big, big question is, and the fact also uh, referred to it is, this group of SMEs, which have in principle a positive business outlook, but are now over in debt and may have another weeks or months till uh, they start earning again, how can they then be helped to overcome this period? And those companies which are highly in debt and have no equity base anymore, will there be possibilities to recapitalize them to or to restructure their, their financing in a way that they will be able to do what Franco right, rightly said, to, to get investor investments into their balance sheets? Because if you are uh, highly overdebt uh, at the moment, it is very, very difficult to get additional money from the outside. Therefore, I think the big two issues are how to find out, how to define uh, those companies uh, which need help, even if they have a positive business outlook to survive this, this period, the next period, and the second question is, uh, what instruments should, can be used, therefore? Uh, therefore, I would like to end my intervention with two questions. So first, Roberta, 
asking her, will there be additional measures from the EBA? She, she pointed a little bit in this direction uh, already in her intervention uh, to allow banks or to help banks um, that they can restructure their loans to SMEs. And the other question more to, to Franco, uh, will it be possible only to do it by regulatory uh, measures or is there additional public support needed uh, to turn loan guarantees into equity or into grants as the European Commission already allows with the temporary framework of aid? Is there a possibility to which type of help you would need to turn normal loans, bank loans into uh, equity or in quasi equity products to restabilize the, the companies and make them able to recover and also to make them able to invest in um, the green and uh, digital transition? Uh, which role can uh, the national recovery and resilience plans play in this regards? Uh, because unfortunately, the member states have rejected that the European Commission is coming forward with the solvency support instrument. So which way of solvency support uh, is needed for those companies which are in principle have a, a positive business outlook and uh, should not leave the market um, because this would make the recovery even worse. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gerhard. Also, your questions, uh, I will take them to the discussion uh, uh, after the panel. First, I would like to move to uh, Deborah Farre from uh, Buick. Um, you're representing uh, consumers. Uh, how do you see, uh, what is your take on moratoria and what should be the next uh, steps? Yes, thank you very much, Willem, and thank you to SEPS for uh, inviting me to, to speak on this very uh, interesting but also crucial topic for uh, households and for consumers. Uh, so as you know, due to the pandemic, many consumers uh, have been and are still uh, confronted with uh, unemployment or, or, or sorry, a loss uh, in their uh, income uh, due to uh, the crisis. And uh, often this uh, results in difficulties regarding their uh, private loan uh, repayments. And in that uh, respect, as mentioned by my co-panelists, uh, both public and private credit moratoria schemes uh, were uh, granted by uh, lenders in, in uh, most member states. And uh, overall, these moratoria were very helpful to provide uh, relief for consumers in financial difficulty. And data from national central banks shows that many households resorted to such measures. And in addition, in, in July 2020, best practice guidelines were agreed amongst stakeholders to ensure uh, the transparency of costs and access conditions to such loan moratoria, which uh, in our view uh, was a very positive development. Uh, however, I also want to highlight a number of shortcomings which were uh, reported by our member organizations on the ground. So there was sometimes in particular a lack of transparency uh, by lenders who failed uh, in some instances to inform consumers um, regarding the availability of more favorable public moratoria schemes under which often uh, no interest had to be paid during the break. So in some, in some instances, lenders were instead putting forward their own conditions or their own uh, more expensive private uh, schemes. And um, in some countries such as Italy and, and Poland, uh, antitrust investigations were, were launched um, because of these issues. Uh, in addition, uh, our members reported in some instances a lack of uh, transparency regarding the costs related to payment moratoria uh, schemes. So as I mentioned, a number of public schemes uh, were granting really full payment holidays to consumers, meaning that there was no interest to be paid during the break. But this was not the case of all moratoria schemes. So a lot of private schemes uh, and also some public schemes still involved uh, the payment of interest during the break. 
And here, for example, in Portugal, uh, book member uh, Deco uh, noted that consumers were not always informed about the cost of repayment, uh, which could be uh, high because uh, moratoria in Portugal involved uh, paying interest during the break, which was then capitalized and uh, interest was recalculated over this new amount, which made the loan overall more expensive. So these are uh, takeaways in our views for any uh, future measures which should be uh, fully transparent. Uh, and this leads me to uh, discuss the, the, the timing of, of moratoria, uh, because uh, as mentioned, um, most applications for public and private moratoria schemes come to an end uh, at the end of March, uh, along with uh, the uh, EBA uh, guidelines mentioned by uh, Roberta. So this means that consumers who fall into temporary uh, payment difficulties from April onwards due to the ongoing crisis and ongoing lockdowns and who have not yet benefited from payment moratoria measures will not be able to apply. And given, given sorry, the, the ongoing crisis, the, the slow pace of vaccinations, uh, we think that it is very important that such consumers keep being uh, supported. So ideally, we would call for a prolongation of payment moratoria schemes only for such consumers, uh, because of course we agree uh, with the EBA that risks should be properly reflected on, on banks' uh, balance sheets. Banks should be properly capitalized. Uh, and this is why we only call for a prolongation of moratoria uh, and of the relevant EBA guidelines for consumers who now uh, enter into payment difficulties and are affected by the third wave of uh, COVID. And if, it, if this is not uh, possible, we believe uh, that such consumers should be granted ad hoc uh, payment uh, holidays, so on, on an ad hoc basis by, by lenders. Uh, and there should be uh, flexibility regarding the impact of such short-term measures on their credit scores. So either no impact or only a, a very short-term impact uh, on their credit score. And uh, we also believe that the most vulnerable consumers should receive full payment holidays, so including um, capital and interest, so that uh, payment uh, holiday measures do not um, give rise to situations of over-indebtedness for such consumers. And secondly, um, now I want to turn to consumers who have already benefited from payment moratoria, but keep experiencing financial uh, difficulties in the longer term. So these consumers, uh, in our view, should also be fully supported. And uh, we believe that uh, lenders should have to propose tailor-made forbearance uh, measures to, to such uh, consumers, which are in their interest and adapted to their uh, individual circumstances. So this should include uh, a range of forbearance measures, either short term or uh, longer term, such as uh, term extensions. And again, for the most vulnerable consumers, we believe that partial uh, debt forgiveness should also be an option. Uh, in addition, consumer uh, borrowers who receive these forbearance measures should be fully informed uh, of their costs, which in our view should be minimal, and uh, of the impact of such continued forbearance on their credit scores. And if uh, short-term measures are granted, so for example, reduced payments, but only for a short period of time because the consumer is expected to return to uh, their normal payments in the short to medium term, we believe that the impact on the consumer credit scores should also be short term, so they should not be penalized in the long term. Um, we uh, believe also, sorry, uh, one uh, important point is that lenders should also actively refer distressed uh, consumer borrowers to uh, free and impartial uh, debt advice uh, services wherever available. And here we want to stress the importance of urgently developing the quality and availability of debt advice uh, services across the EU, uh, including via emergency uh, COVID structures if necessary. Uh, so finally, uh, at book, we believe that uh, the measures that I mentioned should be put in writing, uh, for example, via new ad hoc uh, guidelines, which are endorsed by regulators, including the Commission and the EBA. And we also believe that changes, regulatory changes are needed in the longer term. Uh, in particular, amendments to the consumer credit and mortgage credit uh, directives, which should really provide for a stronger obligation for lenders to 
to grant appropriate forbearance uh, measures to distressed consumer borrowers. Uh, we also believe that the, the consumer credit directive should include responsible uh, lending principles, uh, which are currently missing. And finally, uh, I hope that this does not happen, but in case of uh, future crisis or systemic economic disruptions, we uh, believe that more harmonized uh, support should also be uh, foreseen um, but in, in the regulation for uh, consumers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah. Uh, quite a few points, so most probably we want to elaborate maybe uh, later as well. If you have, of course, a question to Deborah, but also uh, uh, Garrett, with, uh, we spoke before, uh, please use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we now move to uh, Enrique. Uh, I mean, you're representing the uh, credit reference agencies uh, in, in Europe. Um, your members are, are reporting and, and collecting a lot of uh, uh, data on the developments. Uh, what is your take on what you have heard uh, so far? Good morning to everyone. And, and thank you very much to ECRI and SEPS for their invitation to this event. I'm, I'm very honored to participate in this conversation with such distinguished panelists. Acting as a third party between banks and borrowers, the role of credit references uh, is to increase access to affordable credit and to contribute to preventing consumer and businesses over indebtedness. As you said, uh, we meet those goals by collecting and distributing correct, truthful, complete, and up-to-date information about consumers and businesses' past credit and current payment behavior. So when public and private payment holidays were implemented, our challenge was how to maintain the accuracy and integrity of our databases, whilst working with banks and regulators to minimize the financial impact of COVID-19 to affected consumers and businesses so that lending activity could continue. A key step towards ensuring the accuracy and integrity of databases was the adoption by policymakers of the principle of continued full file sharing of credit data which basically calls on lenders to continue furnishing full information to the credit databases so that confidence in the credit data reporting system is maintained. Now, to minimize the impact on consumers and businesses' credit histories, we also agreed with banks and regulators that certain reporting safeguards were introduced. These safeguards varied across markets because the legal framework for credit reporting and the credit reporting infrastructure across the EU also differ as the survey um, uh, testifies. So flexibility here was key. For example, in some EU countries, banks reported to databases that borrowers were current on their loans if they had sought relief due to the pandemic. In other countries, payment holidays were recorded by attaching flags or special indicators to loans, signaling that a, that a loan was under a payment holiday and signaling also the type of moratorium and or its duration. So to conclude on the past, where public or private payment holidays have been implemented, CRAs have generally processed information related to the granting of a moratorium. This processing that includes several reporting techniques is done objectively in a way that prevents any negative impact on credit files. Let me now fast forward a bit to the present. As you will know, application for payment holidays are still available in a number of countries and for certain types of borrowers and or loans. With benefits from these holidays in place until the end of June, according to the guidelines, guidance from the EBA, Information on missed repayments has yet to arrive to credit databases in a good number of instances. Now, where the payment holidays ended earlier, the preliminary picture emerging from databases is not too worrisome. Broadly speaking, there is not a significant increase in arrears or defaults for credit accounts. And this is particularly the case for the core economies of the Eurozone. This applies not only for individuals, but for companies as well. The numbers are slightly more troubling for younger borrowers as they are possibly less economically stable. In the UK, there is a noticeable increase in the number of utility accounts in arrears, though. It should be noted that the uptake of moratoria has been very different across the EU, as reported by the uh, EBA. 
So this will play a part too in the assessment of the real impact with its true extent becoming more visible towards the end of this year. So to conclude on the present, we're not seeing a sharp increase overall in the number of credit accounts in arrears at the moment. I would like to conclude with three observations for the next phase of the economic crisis. First one, the credit reporting system cannot exit the pandemic and the economic crisis in a weaker position that it had entered into. To the contrary, access to reliable credit information, which is the cornerstone of most lending decisions, can help address both liquidity and risk aversion issues and can assist banks in credit classifications and expected credit loss computations. So it is important to ensure that credit reporting systems continue performing adequately. Second, with payment holidays coming to an end, consumers and businesses are likely to need bridge support between the end of the moratoria and the moment in which they will be able to restart their economic activity. That support could come in various forms, including more innovative credit products, and Franco was talking about that, or debt restructuring. We stand ready to facilitate financial support for viable borrowers and are available to offer our expertise and tools to banks, regulators and businesses on the criteria that can be applied to judge whether a business is viable or not, and therefore whether it has or has not reasonable recovery prospects. Third, there are also concrete, more operational, if you like, areas where our industry is ready to continue working to minimize any possible negative impact on consumers and businesses. I'd like to mention just four examples. One, on transparency. It should be clear how banks will report and credit databases process payment delays, deferrals, and or restructuring arrangements. If need be, we are happy to work with regulators, banks, and other stakeholders to guide the market in this regard. Two, on complaints and dispute handling processes. We understand more than ever that borrowers expect that their credit histories reflect their current status. So we stand ready to ramp up our complaints and dispute handling processes to ensure that any inquiries are addressed adequately and timely. Three, on credit scoring models and algorithms. To ensure their accuracy, we will review credit scoring models and algorithms based on statistically relevant performance data from the initial phase of the crisis. As I said, it is still, however, early to draw conclusions from the impact of, of the pandemic in most markets. When those reviews are completed, we stand ready to provide training to banks and information to consumers and businesses on revised data inputs, if any, and scoring models. Four, on education. CRAs are already launching targeted financial literacy programs, advising borrowers experiencing payment difficulties due to the crisis to approach credit providers to negotiate payment deferrals and restructuring of facilities. We are also emphasizing the need for borrowers to conduct more frequent review of their own credit reports. So to conclude on this point, as the true extent of the economic crisis emerges, we will need collective, bold and prompt actions to avoid damaging economic recovery. A well-functioning credit reporting system is an integral part of that solution. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Enrique. Uh, many points also from, from your side. I think one point I would like to take to the other uh, panelists uh, from your discussion is maybe uh, the, the first uh, countries where the, the moratoria have been uh, relieved and that you basically say there is, uh, in general, overall a limited impact if we see an impact, it's primarily on the, the younger uh, borrowers and the uh, some companies in particular uh, sectors. Um, as we have here, of course, representatives from both the businesses and uh, consumers, uh, I would like to ask both uh, Garrett and Deborah, do you recognize uh, this and, uh, uh, or, or do you expect it to be different uh, when more countries are uh, expiring the moratoria. Maybe uh, Deborah first? 
Yes, so I think that the, thank you, Willem. Uh, I think that the evidence is uh, so far is quite uh, encouraging uh, regarding consumers being able to resume payments uh, after uh, the end of their uh, payment moratoria. Um, I would not say that, uh, um, on, uh, sorry, on the basis of uh, reports from our member organizations, we haven't seen a, a distinction in relation to the age uh, of consumers, uh, but the consumers who are most affected, of course, uh, are consumers working in sectors which are the most uh, affected by COVID and also, uh, in particular, by government measures. So these would include, uh, for example, uh, catering uh, or uh, the tourism uh, sector or, or also the, the cultural uh, sector. So, so these consumers might uh, continue experiencing uh, financial difficulties as uh, local down uh, measures uh, keep being uh, implemented by, by governments. Thank you very much, Deborah. Gerard? Well, <clears throat> uh, for the moment, I think the picture uh, which was painted by Enrique and also by Franco uh, are right. As we see at the moment, hardly an increase in, well, we don't see any increase in, in, in insolvency procedures. Uh, we hear uh, that most of the SMEs are for the moment still able uh, to, to serve their payment um, obligations. However, what we also see is that many SMEs uh, and also self-employed are digging into their savings for pensions uh, and, and in, the, in the reserves. Yeah? And uh, this makes the situation for the future uh, more difficult. <clears throat> uh, our service show for the, for the midterm perspective that 10% on average of SMEs say they will face uh, a significant risk of insolvency uh, if there is uh, no additional measures taken. And, 30 and this goes up to 30% for sectors, as I mentioned by Deborah, in the tourism sector, event sector, catering, etc., etc., etc. Here, um, I think, especially in the tourism sector, uh, there will be the need to do something. Uh, to allow them to survive till the summer season, if a summer season is possible with all, but otherwise, and, and this is what I meant before with this restructuring uh, of, uh, of, of financing. Uh, and the big question is, and here I may be a little bit different from Deborah, we are aware that we cannot load all the risks and all the burdens on the shoulder of banks. There has the uh, public support measures, otherwise, uh, what we not, not want, and nobody uh, would profit from it if, if this current uh, economic crisis turns into a, a new financial crisis. So this has to be avoided in any case, and here uh, support measures are needed. And these support measures, uh, of course, has to be designed in a way which is not too costly for taxpayers, because um, we are aware that uh, the public, public budgets are also tightened in the meantime. Uh, for, and therefore, I think avoiding the public sector to pay out the guarantees they have given to banks for loans during the, the crisis, and uh, this was billions, uh, trillions of loans, um, uh, to avoid to, to pay these guarantees by uh, restructuring uh, and uh, turning some of them into equity measures, which can then sold later, et cetera, could be a, a way uh, in the right direction. And uh, what is also important to know here is that we see now the commission published a study last week that self-employed, especially uh, self-employed in many sectors are even more hit by the crisis than employees. And this, uh, very small self-employed people without uh, employees, not really companies. Uh, here, you cannot do restructuring in the sense of equity measures. Here, I think there will be uh, solutions with grants, uh, the absolute necessity uh, to allow, allow them to, 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 to survive and to, 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 to get into recovery. 
Thanks a lot, uh, Gerhard, as well. Uh, if you have any questions for Gerhard or the other panelists, uh, please use the Q&A. In the meantime, we have received uh, a few. Uh, I will come back to them. And of course, one of the big questions is about uh, what the EBA will do. We'll do that uh, in, in the next round of, of, of answers. But first, I would like to also ask uh, Franco. Um, yeah, you have also heard uh, Enrique, uh, Deborah, and uh, Gerhard now. Um, do you share uh, their impressions or uh, to what extent do you share them from uh, taking the, the Italian uh, perspective and being, of course, in contact with many uh, uh, Italian SMEs? Well, I, I must say that I, I really agree with them. I mean, I really agree with Enrico when he's saying that the situation is not as bad as we expected it to be. And I must also say that we did not only uh, examine what happened to those customers whose moratoria ended, but we, we did much more. We examined one by one our customers because you know we know that the moratorium is going to end, and so we 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 were not just we are not just expecting it to it to be ended. We are just moving in advance to see how these clients are behaving. As I said, we we focused on those most vulnerable clients in those sectors that are deemed to be most vulnerable, and we examined one by one these clients. We talked to these clients, and even in this case, we had a reaction. That was quite. That is quite good, actually. Um, even when we we offered to restructure their debt, for in some cases, they did not accept it because they they turned out to be in a better position than we than we expected. So, I mean, the situation is not as bad as everybody was expected it to be. So that that's a good point, and that goes back to what I said before that uh, when whenever we need to find a solution, that solution must be uh, tailor-made on our customer. It cannot be a solution as before that is the same for all customers because not all customers are in the same situation now. And so we need really to focus our efforts on those who really need help in this moment. And going back to what Gerard said, and also Deborah, I mean, our foc I mean we, we all have the same uh, goal. Uh, we all have the same goal that our customer need to be good. I mean need to need to recover from this situation so, so we are all working on that direction obviously there are some cases when uh, a bank is not able to do much because the situation is really uh, is really bad i mean we cannot find any sign of recovery i mean we need a transformational activity in the company that can be helped but cannot be on the on the side of the bank so there must be some kind of support for those kind of clients but uh, in other cases, even when the debt is high, I mean, the bank like to take risks and we do take risks, but when these risks are acceptable risks. Um, I, I just go back to what uh, Roberta said at the beginning. I mean, the solidity of the bank <clears throat> is a, a really a good asset in this moment to overcome the crisis. We cannot put at risk this solidity. So we need to take risks, but at the same time, we need to take good risks. And, and that's why we, we really need to focus on what we we, we are doing. Okay, thanks, uh, Franco. We, of course, also had from the first round of interventions the question from Gerhard, and he was basically asking you, um, hey, of course, you take many uh, initiatives yourself, but is there a need for additional, uh, say, government support measures uh, in your activities? Also for the part that you mentioned, for instance, on the transformation uh, or um, the, 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 yeah. the, say the, the, the dealing with over indebted uh, companies as well as households. Yeah, I mean, those are the, the areas where uh, government support should be uh, more more helpful, obviously, because the banks, as I said, cannot uh, uh, be the only actors in this field. I think we should work on something different that probably in a small, small and medium enterprise was not pursued before, like public-private uh, uh, partnerships. And as Gera said, I mean, that's a good idea on my side. That, I mean, a new financing by, by the government could be seen as a semi semi equity and could be transformed in equity if things don't go as we expect uh, them to go so i mean we we need to find different solutions also i mean we can help our customers and we already do in finding a way to overcome the crisis in a different way like for example finding a partner 
with a merger with other partners and that's something that we are doing um, because sometimes i mean you're not good by yourself but you still have some good quality that combined with other actors in the uh, other peers in the that sector could uh, uh, could could work so we are really helping to to find this alternative solution we need to think in a different way because we are not in an ordinary situation um I assume that maybe your um, clientele don't include the uh, uh, sole proprietaries uh, as raised. Is that correct? Uh, because of course that's usually a group that falls a bit in between the households and the uh, businesses. Is this? Uh, do you have any views on, on no, those? No. No, no, but we do have many of them, actually. That's what I call micro enterprises. Uh, but I mean, that, that's, uh, that's a big part of our economy in Italy. So I mean, that's, that's a bulge portion of our clientele. I mean, we, those customers are really in the middle between consumers and uh, small enterprises. But still, I mean, we, we go back to what I said. I mean, not, cust not all customers are the same. We need to focus on the customers and examine them as they are and help whoever has the capability with our help to overcome the crisis. In other cases, we need to find other solution that cannot be a bank solution, I guess. Okay. Uh, Deborah, you wanted to also add something to what Franco just uh, yes, mentioned? Yes, I just wanted to jump on this point and on, on, um, on the need for public support measures, which was mentioned by, by Gerhard, and I fully agree that uh, support uh, from governments is fully needed to, to, to support consumers uh, who keep experiencing difficulties, for example, uh, with uh, an employment aid or, or some health help sorry for consumers who struggle to to repay uh, their mortgages uh, regarding the, their primary residence however uh, i also think that in parallel uh, EU-wide support uh, is needed uh, from regulators and uh, from the industry for uh, consumers to uh, ensure uh, that there is a high level and uniform level of protection for consumer borrowers to, who, who still struggle to, to repay their loans. And this is why I also want to uh, stress the importance of granting appropriate uh, forbearance measures to such uh, consumers. And it might seem uh, obvious, but it is not. Uh, for example, our, our French member, Uf Seke Choisir, uh, recently uh, published uh, a study which shows that uh, less than one third of consumer uh, household non-performing loans are being uh, restructured. Um, uh, so these uh, NPLs just uh, sit uh, on banks' uh, balance sheets uh, and uh, uh, restructuring measures are not actively offered to uh, consumers. And this is why we think that there should be an incentive or an obligation for uh, lenders to, to provide support uh, to consumers uh, in uh, difficulty. And this uh, is also, uh, of course, in the interest of uh, financial uh, stability and of the system as a whole, because it prevents uh, the buildup of, of non-performing loans. So I just wanted to add this point. OK. Um, and uh, I also look at the questions that we received from the uh, audience. Um, and there was one uh, question for you, uh, Deborah, in particular on, uh, do you have any views on what the impact would be on the, say, the consequence would be on the banks uh, if you would extend the moratoria uh, between the current uh, uh, agreed periods? Yes, yeah, so I mean, again, uh, we fully agree with the need uh, for risks to be reflected on, on banks' balance sheets. It, it is very important uh, for financial uh, stability um, and uh, to ensure that banks are, are sufficiently capitalized, uh, also for the for the sake, sorry, of, of taxpayers. And this is why uh, we only call for a prolongation of applications for people who have not yet received payment moratoria but experience difficulties due to the ongoing 
crisis. So again, for uh, people who experience longer term difficulties and who have already benefited from moratoria measures, uh, we do not call for uh, an indefinite prolongation of the moratoria. Of course, this was, would not uh, be uh, responsible and it would not uh, necessarily uh, be in their interest either uh, because, as I mentioned uh, earlier, a lot of payment uh, moratoria schemes were not free uh, for consumers. So we don't want to push them into uh, situations of, of over-indebtedness. Um, so uh, I hope this answers to, to, to the question, but this is what uh, we would propose. And if this is not possible, uh, again, uh, we want to focus on, on ad hoc uh, payment holidays um, being provided to uh, these consumers who now uh, start experiencing uh, financial difficulties. Uh, and one important point is the impact of these short-term measures on the consumer's uh, credit scores. Uh, which, again, in our view, for short-term measures such as payment moratoria, the impact should be uh, minimal uh, because uh, the impact on, on the credit score, if negative, is of course import, uh, in, yes, important. Uh, uh, it uh, then uh, prevents consumers from taking up further loans or makes uh, further loans uh, more uh, expensive. Voilà, thank you. Thanks a lot, Deborah. I understood also you raised, of course, an important point on what it then should mean for the credit scoring. I come back to you, Roberta, because there are a few uh, questions waiting for you uh, in, in the, the Q&A. But I, I might also ask Enrique, uh, what are your views on, in particular, the credit uh, the scoring that uh, Deborah just mentioned? Yes, um, on, on this point, I think it is it is important to note that this these are tools basically designed to help lenders price credit risk and understand whether the um, credit facility is affordable for the consumer. Um, these are sophisticated tools that they take into account um, relevant historical data, and this means that the changing in the methodology of the scores it is a process that it is not taking lightly. Um, so it takes time indeed to have observations and eventually take those observations to changes in the methodology. We have already mentioned uh, and committed to the European Commission that we do not uh, see an imminent or immediate impact of the credit moratoria on the, on the credit scores. So if indeed what Deborah is calling for is, um, let's say, um, avoidance of, of a short term impact on credit scores, I think, that's basically granted in the sense that we need much more time to change the, the methodologies. So um, I think that should sort of provide some reassurance that, that we understand and, and take this concern going forward. Um, as I have the floor now, if, if I could just wade a little bit into the debate about um, fiscal support, um, I think this, this is something where um, CRAs can, can help. Um, in certain countries, public authorities have access already to the information collected by providers of credit reporting systems. And those authorities can utilize granular data housed in, in these systems and the analytic tools about credit portfolios for recalibrating policies, including fiscal support programs. In fact, it could be an idea perhaps to, to build or strengthen the capacity of regulators uh, and policymakers to utilize the credit reporting information and rating products for credit bureaus and credit registers to support data-driven policy interventions, such as targeted allocation of credit or, or equity, as Franco was saying, to critical industries or sectors uh, or to firms with higher possibilities or probability uh, of survival. So I encourage this uh, let's say more newer or a little bit uh, out of the beaten track use of the information housed by credit reporting systems. Thanks a lot, uh, Enrique. I think, uh, Gerhard, uh, you must probably also have your views on uh, what is necessary in additional uh, measures as already discussed by uh, Franco, Deborah, and Enrique. Well, I think. One of the most important uh, discussion we have at the moment at the political level is uh, the elaboration of the national recovery resilience plans. Uh, this instrument on the one side can help uh, to rebalance asymmetric impacts due to the crisis in, in different countries. Uh, 
um, and also can provide uh, and now targeted solutions for specific sectors uh, where needed. <clears throat> I am still a little bit hesitating to say, let's change regulations, especially if it's about uh, uh, stabilization of the financial systems. Uh, it is risky to use uh, regulations which is built for financial stability. And we really had learned the lessons from the last financial crisis. We use them now uh, to solve problems which uh, should be solved somewhere else. This is true for the over for, for the for the crisis we have now with the, with the recession due to the pandemic. But this is also true uh, for uh, the, for greening, etc. Yeah? Putting more risks uh, on on the shoulders of the financial systems only because it's for green investments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I think is the wrong way. It's a, it seems sometimes an easy way out. But it's very short-sighted uh, and, 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 and not the, the right proposal. Here, we need fiscal measures. We need more targeted support measures at, at, at national level by the governments. Uh, and there should be the right framework to allow banks and SMEs, banks and consumers to find the individual solutions uh, to help those through as a, Companies like those two who uh, deserve it because they will uh, have a positive perspective for the future. Thank you very much, uh, Gerhard. I would like now to move to Roberta. There are quite a few uh, questions piling up uh, for you. I think the most pressing one that was asked several times is what's going to happen with the guidelines? Are you going to extend them? Are they going to be expired? Uh, and then, uh, uh, if they're maybe first answer that question, uh, it was burning, yes. uh, I think, uh, from Tanki de Lunoa and Amrit Reshner, but there were some others as well uh, that raised this point. Yes, exactly. I think I touched already on this point during my opening remarks, uh, and I would reiterate that. Uh, uh, let me say first of all that we also have a COVID-19 reporting data and we can confirm what has been said by other speakers that of uh, those loans where the moratoria has expired that now accounts for our data uh, for 60% of the loans. We don't see uh, signs of deterioration yet. And, and also uh, it's, I'm very uh, glad to hear from Franco that they are also uh, checking these also for loans that are currently under moratoria, they don't see this deterioration. Uh, and this for me means that uh, exactly our guidelines were targeting, were, I mean, we're serving the purpose exactly to provide breathing space to borrower to navigate the crisis. But let's not forget that we are talking about prudential requirement. And what we did, we tried to use as much as possible the flexibility in the framework. But since we are from a prudential perspective, we need to um, maintain the trust in the risk measures. This is our main objective. Let's not forget that. So I totally agree that the risk could not be taken by the banks. But on top of that, we cannot have, uh, run the risk that uh, risk measure by the bank are not trusted because this could have also very unpleasant consequences in terms of financial stability. And we learned that from the past crisis. So having said that, uh, there is no plan from, an EBA, from EBA to extend the guidelines further. We, um, exactly, the, the purpose was to serve uh, and help short-term liquidity issue. I very much see the issue of the hospitality system, uh, uh, restaurant, tourism. Uh, this is uh, terrible. And But the problem there is that exactly the question is if the summer will come back to, to good business and we cannot afford from a, a prudential perspective this if. So this should not be solved, solved by, from changing the regulatory framework, but rather from having more targeted fiscal measure for this sector that are targeting and helping this, uh, this sector that have been uh, um, hit by the crisis. Because what we did was already providing the maximum flexibility there is in the framework. Uh, and also to come back to, uh, so in general, we also, I already said this in my opening remarks, we don't 
saying that we don't extend the guidelines, we are not in any way not uh, incentivizing governments to extend their moratoria or also banks to have tailored uh, forbearance measures. This is definitely not what we want, the message that we want to signal. Actually, instead, we want to come back to uh, tailored measure for the borrowers that are more at, at risk. And this measure could be structured in many ways. Uh, I want to also to, to point out that uh, once there will be a concession for a borrower that is in financial difficulties, this will bring, will bring to forbearance measure. But then in order to trigger the default definition, you will need to trigger 1% uh, of diminished financial obligation. So in order for the distress restructuring to be an indication of unlikeliness to pay, there is this threshold 1% to be triggered. And if we are talking about only to bridging, uh, uh, suppose that there, first of all, the moratorium is expiring at the end of March, but still, uh, there could be more the effect of the moratorium because this means they can agree up to until to actually tomorrow. But then uh, th this does not mean that tomorrow the effect will end. And so if we're talking about bridging towards and at least this summer for the vaccination schedule and for the business to come back to normal, first of all, moratoria will still have an effect. Secondly, there could be targeted forbearance measure where if like structure in certain way, it's not necessary, they will not necessarily hit the one person threshold. So it's not a given that they will uh, bring to default um, in the bank's balance sheet. And secondly, there were, uh, I, I cannot agree more with other speakers that there is uh, now the need of fiscal measure. Uh, and I think asking this effort from a prudential perspective could only backfire for, on consumers and SMEs. Because if, uh, the, as I said, the banks were part of the solution in this crisis, not uh, part of the problem. But if we start uh, having, uh, like, if there will be no trust in the bank measure, measurement of risk, uh, we could end up uh, with, on what we see back in 2009. So I, I, I don't know if I answered all uh, the question because more or less they were all um, around this, um, this point. Um, well, I think maybe two two questions I would still maybe uh, distinguish uh, so, so uh, the find there from that were raised. One was also a bit like, do you see big differences across countries? So. Uh, is, is there a need for more interventions in certain countries than in others? Yes, definitely. But this has been the case since the beginning, uh, since the onset of the financial crisis. The responses and the, the way moratoria, but also public guarantee schemes has been used, has been completely fragmented across Europe. But uh, in this sense, rightly so, because in this here, uh, the need, uh, it's more like a national need, and this should be more like a national. I mean, it has been definitely fragmented. So there is a huge variation in this respect. Yes, uh, these I can confirm. But also, uh, and also, I think. There was a question that uh, I mentioned accommod accommodative measures, uh, but these um, probably, I don't know, maybe uh, was not uh, um, signaling any change in the regulatory framework so far. As what I said is that uh, uh, as of today, we believe the regulatory framework is fit for purpose. And we are, of course, monitoring the situation and we will keep monitoring it as we did uh, in the past. And we will try to act as, as fast as possible if need, if need be. But at the moment, uh, we think that... Uh, so our worry at the moment is uh, bank asset quality and uh, be sure that banks are adequately capitalized. So we don't want to ruin all the reform that has been done in the last years to, al to allow the banks to be uh, well capitalized as they, as they were at the beginning of this crisis. And uh, in fact, that was quite positive uh, because uh, as of today, we, 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 we could use the bank as a, as a part of the solution and also we, uh, we see so far that this moratoria had a good effect. Thanks a lot. I look at the panelists whether someone that wants to have a, a last response because I think we have answered more or less all the questions and we're almost running uh, towards the 90 minutes that we had scheduled for this uh, webinar. Uh, if not, uh, I would like to uh, thank, uh, the, first of all, the panelists very much for uh, participating this morning and their very informative and great uh, contributions, but also the participants. I think this today we have had a, a record number of participants for an ACRI event. I mean, our, we went beyond the capacity we would have had at the SEPS premises. So in that sense, COVID fortunately also has some advantages that we are reaching out uh, to more uh, people. So thanks a lot for, to you all uh, for participating today. Uh, if you want to stay, um, 
updated about the events, publications, etc. of ECRI, I kindly ask you to subscribe to our uh, newsletter if you have not done yet. Um, and otherwise, uh, I'm looking forward to see you again, uh, either in per person at some point, hopefully this year already, and otherwise in our online uh, events. Uh, for now, thank you very much and have a very nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very thank much, you. everyone. Thank you.